Well, gentlemen, we're back again with lecture number three of our electric motor design course. And with this lecture, we're going to study control strategies for our three machine types. Now, the purpose of this study is not to uh, teach you how to design the controls, the inverters for these machines, but the purpose of this uh, analysis in this lecture is to basically study the characteristics of each of the machines and what effects on the ultimate performance do the characteristics of each machine have with terms of, in terms of torque versus speed as to how it is driven by some inverter. For example, a very well-known uh, inverter company in this world by the name of Yaskawa has a, uh, a very high performance uh, line of drives that they produce and th this is a piece of their advertising and what's interesting about this is that this same inverter and, and by, by the way the presentation of this slide uh, adds credence or proof to to the whole idea of this lecture series that uh, these three motor types that we're studying use one stator that are driven by the same inverter because here's an example of an inverter that will use that can be used for all three of those machines. It's based on current vector control technology, Q and D axis current control, and uh, it will drive an AC induction machine. It'll drive a brushless machine, either a surface PM or an internal PM. It will uh, give you just simple constant uh, volts to hertz control, open loop, or it'll give you flux vector control, closed or open loop. So, so this is a, a product that can be used for all three of our motor types. The only difference being is in the software. Now, first of all, I want to I want to quickly review the the torque speed curves. This is a torque speed curve of a BL DC motor, a brushless DC motor. But it's also the same shape curve as a uh, shunt or a uh, permanent magnet DC commutated motor. And so what we have at, uh, at, at, at zero speed, and by the way, I want to point out that this torque is shown torque versus speed. Originally, when brush type motors were developed and induction motors were developed to run off a, uh, off a brush, Brush type motors running off of batteries and induction motors running off the grids, all the performance curves were plotted speed versus torque, not torque versus speed. It's only since uh, inverters were used have we changed these performance curves around to plot torque versus speed. But the point here is this, that if I want to change the speed capabilities of a motor of a DC machine, I change the voltage. You see this curve here? Here's a, uh, a, a torque speed curve with a lower voltage than this curve. So the voltage has, uh, the speed has nothing to do with frequency with this machine. It has to do with, with the voltage applied, the DC voltage applied to the inverter that's running the motor. Now, there's, there's, uh, this, this dotted line here represents the, the performance of the motor when it's driven by an inverter. This curve assumes infinite current and it su assumes that there's no limit to the current just like a DC motor connected to a battery. But as soon as I connect to, it, to a, an inverter, the inverter has certain size transistors in it that cannot pass more than X amount of amps, otherwise they blow up. So this line represents the current limit torque speed performance. So the torque can be constant from stall out to where the back EMF of the motor and the DC motor uh, voltage are the same value. When they're the same value, I can't operate a continuous torque anymore. My performance is limited by the, the, the back EMF so that, so that the, uh, uh, the torque speed curve actually goes down to zero. So if, if I take the DC voltage and divide it by the phase resistance, I get a current, I multiply it times a torque constant, 
and that's the uh, the stall torque, the lock, locked rotor torque. If I uh, uh, the no load speed is the is uh, when the back EMF and the the no load speeds when the back EMF and the applied voltage are equal. So that's this point. Now, seldom is it straight like this. It curves a little here and there due to saturation, things of that sort. But uh, we're going to note here in a minute the difference between this curve and the typical curve for induction motor. And by the way, this shape of curve, this is a constant torque range. If this is curved a bit like that, you have a constant horsepower range. So for traction or servos or anything, we're trying to get this shape of curve out of a motor that inherently has that shape of curve. Here's an induction machine at constant voltage and frequency. So here's its motoring range and here's its generating range. Here's the synchronous speed. And so to produce torque, I have to load it down so it slows down. So you have some slip here. Here's the maximum slip. Uh, if you try to load it down on any beyond that, that's a breakdown torque so it stalls. Now that's totally different than the the torque speed curve of, of a uh, brushless or a synchronous or a DC machine. You see the difference? That that curve is going to be inside of, you know, in, inside of here. It looks, looks something like that. I should have superimposed on top of each other. So the trick is, is to use the controller to understand the induction motor and use the controller, the mag control the magnetizing uh, current and the frequency so that I can convert a, a torque speed curve into a shape that looks uh, like this one. And uh, here's how you do that. You, uh, here's a family of torque speed curves, each one at a different voltage and frequency. So if you, so if I, if I project a shape over this, you know, this represents a whole family of curves. So basically the motor, the, the, this motor that you see in this curve looks like that's its peak torque and it can't produce it down there, but it can produce it at this low speed if I control the magnetizing current and the voltage correctly. See, I can get that peak torque down in the low speeds. I can even get it lower than that. So uh, uh, you can usually, as we'll see later, you can usually define the induction motor's desired torque speed curve for constant torque and uh, power, constant torque range and power range rated and peak, you can usually define it with uh, five or six curves that will define the, the, the major points that uh, describe that envelope, okay? So uh, the, the first brushless motors that were used 40 years ago were trapezoid, had trapezoid uh, back EMF, and they were driven for the simplest way possible, just using six transistors and, and switching the voltage from, uh, from lead to lead. And, and this uh, close, closely represented the performance of a permanent magnet DC commutated motor. So that's why I would call a, a BLDC or a brushless DC motor. The drive method used was called a six-step drive or a trap drive, and it was used by billions, uh, multiple billions of motors around the world and still used to this day. Muffin fans, cooling fans, and electronics. Winchester disk drives used in computers, floppy disk drives, VCRs, uh, uh, CD drives, uh, uh, anything that spins a platter at constant speed or a fan at constant speed and needs to be brushless, they're going to use simple permanent magnet brushless motors with these six-step trapezoid drives. They're, you can get them all on a chip with uh, commutation, closed loop, uh, speed control, and all these features. And, and uh, it's by far the most popular uh, drive on Earth is a trapezoid drive for a motor. Uh, Historically, the, uh, the second most uh, popular drive for, for motors has probably been the, the hysteresis sine drive, a, a sine drive that uh, <coughs> applies sinusoidal currents. And uh, it does with, this with PWM uh, of, of 
method of uh, chopping or turning the voltage on and off within a hysteresis band uh, through a reference shape of a sine, sine wave shape. But the importance and difference between these two we're going to look at in a minute. It has to do with not the shape, but the, but the commutation, how it's commutated. That's what uh, uh, is most significant about the difference between a sine drive and a trapezoid drive. And whether the back EMF is trapezoid or sine is not near as important <coughs> as the commutation, whether the phases are commutated for 120 degrees or 180 degrees which means whether using two-thirds of the copper or all the copper. Now, for the highest performance machines, the most recent drives are these uh, uh, D, and Q, D and Q axis current flux sign vector drives. They pretty much replace hysteresis sign drives, uh, and uh, they uh, absolutely dominate the vehicle electric traction business and uh, servo systems in industrial applications and, and most everywhere. They used to be very expensive, but they're not anymore. But what we, but th those, those, uh, that discussion, the pros and cons is not part of this lecture series. What we want to do is understand the performance effects of the motor and how we uh, need to recognize those in such a way that we can design the machines and get the right number of turns and the right amount of flux for the least amount of lost energy. Uh, some of the early brushless m motors used in disk drives, and, and, and hundreds of millions of them were made, were two-phase, and, and they used hall switches or, or optical switches, light-emitting diodes and phototransistor packs with interrupters to uh, determine where the north and the south poles were on the rotor so it knew when to gate the transistors to uh, put the right uh, put the current in at the right uh, angular position of the rotor and the right polarity of current and uh, three phase machines have become the the most popular versions of those have, uh, have I guess three phases is always going to be the most popular even though six and nine phases are sometimes used. You just have multiple uh, three-phase circuits. And uh, some I've heard uh, drive people argue that in a, uh, a large machine, the uh, transistor packs, the cost of transistor packs is based on the volume that are sold. So you're going to sell a lot more 100 amp transistor packs at, at 600 volts, and you will uh, uh, three, 300 amp transistor packs. So it's, it's probably cheaper to use 300 amp transistor packs than one 600 amp, or, or one 300 amp, excuse me. So you could wind a machine with, with, with three three-phase circuits, or two three-phase circuits and use a separate transistor pack for module for each one, IGBT bridge for each one, and uh, save money. You would also have to have more connections, but your wire size would be smaller in the machine. That's a good thing. And you'd have your heat in the uh, transistor pack spread over a larger surface area for thermal diffusion of the losses with two or three packs instead of one. Uh, the, uh, the principal power converter topologies are then six-step control with 120 electrical degree commutation with only two phases on at a time. Or the other one is hysteresis current control uh, with 180 degree electrical commutation. That means all three phases are on all the time. And then the uh, uh, D and Q axis current sign control has the same 180 degree electrical commutation. The motor, the motor doesn't know the difference between choice two and three. It notices a big difference between one, two, and three, but no difference between two and three. As far as the motor is concerned, two and three are the same. As far as, but uh, number one is totally different. In all cases, the currents are really limited by chopping or controlling the voltage. You can't directly control current, you control voltage to control, control current. 
so uh, this chopping, the, the number of times you chop determines what the current profile looks like. So uh, a, a, a low PWM frequency results in a, in, a, in a lousy current wave shape. It's got a lot of noise on it. And that puts uh, heating and harmonics in the motor as well as losses in the transistors. A, a, a high uh, PWM frequency gives you a beautiful current wave shape. The motor loves that, but but those high but that results in higher higher switching losses for the transistors. So it's so uh, motors would like to have a perfect sine wave. So we have to compromise. And here here's a picture that shows us uh, an ideal perfect sinusoidal current over trapezoidal, uh, excuse me, not current, back EMF. This, this is back EMF. A trapezoidal back EMF is dotted versus the sine back EMF. Now, it's not easy to design and build a motor that gives you either one of these. Most motors are somewhere in between these two. So, so uh, but we don't, we don't really care. You see, uh, this is a 360-degree plot, and... Uh, <clears throat> so if you've got the voltage in the background, uh, the back EMF voltage, and you're applying a voltage to the motor, the only voltage you have available to push current in the machine is the difference between this back EMF voltage and the applied voltage, unless you feel weakened, so, uh, or, or advanced commutate. This is what a typical six-step drive looks like. We all know what that is. We've got six transistors there connecting to the three phases and uh, with a rectifier on the front end. So you take AC here, make DC out of it, and regenerate uh, DC. And you can use these transistor bridge for a six-step drive or, or a sine drive. Either one It's just a matter of how you gate the transistors. The six-step, what does six-step mean? Well, some, some uh, AC inverter guys think of six step as, as six steps to simulate a sine wave. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the six commutation steps. So that if I have three lead wires to the motor connected in a, in a Y configuration, <clears throat> if I uh, gate transistors to have connect the voltage across these two terminals, well, let, let's start here. I'll, I'll, I'll gate the transistors to have uh, current flow across these two terminals. So there's step one. I leave this transistor on and, and turn that one off, turn this one on, and the current continues to flow the same direction through that phase. But instead of going out through this phase, it goes through that phase. So that's step two. Then step three then step four, then step five, then step six. So those are your six steps of, of commutation. And you can see those steps as they're gated here. But, but you're, so, so you have two phases with current flowing at any given time. They're, the other phase has no, when you've got current flowing here, there's no current flowing there. So all the torques produced by the <coughs> amp returns from the coils from these two phases. And, uh, um, the the other the other problem with this is that uh, uh, you're you're only on for for two thirds of the time. These transistors are only causing current to flow through these two phases two thirds of the time. So you're using two thirds of the copper, and you're only commutating. You're utilizing that copy, copper two thirds of the time. And so if your, if your back EMF and your wave shapes don't match quite well, you're going to get a lot of torque ripple with this kind of a machine. Uh, if the back EMF is uh, sinusoidal instead of trapezoidal, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It certainly... It changes the torque ripple and that sort of thing, but the commutation and all that's exactly the same. There's no really difference. When you when you align the commutation signals up, you you center the uh, 
the uh, back EMF wave shape over the square wave. These are the six trapezoid current wave shapes that you want to get. You'll notice that these are centered over the peak and, and of course, the zero crossing. So, so, so I don't gate the transistor. See, the, here's 180 degrees from here to here. So 120 out of 180 is 60. So you got 30 of that here and 30 of that here. So I, my back, when I gate this transistor, my back EMF is already this value. With a side drive, I start here. So I have the full DC rail voltage to start, uh, you know, to push current into the winding. Whereas with a trapezoid drive or six step drive, I don't have the full DC rail voltage to push current into the winding because I, I don't, switch for 15 electrical degrees and by then the back EMF has already increased to about a third of its total value so uh, there's some drastic results to that that you can see right here here's a real example of a, of a brushless six-step motor like I described and at a thousand rpm the the it's going slow enough that even though it's commutating late, 15 degrees late, it's got enough, the, the back EMF is not so high that, uh, and it's going slow enough that the uh, current rises very fast, almost like a square wave. And then, then the current limit circuit causes PWM chopping there to limit the current there. And, and then you have, uh, this. The, here's your 60 degree where you switched uh, one of the coils from th this this is uh, phase A to B here and this is phase A to C okay so uh, now all we do is double the speed to 2000 rpm we don't change anything by the way this horizontal scale is angle okay it's rotor angle so uh, by going twice the speed we're going through the same angle. That's why this, these, these spacings are the same. But we have half the time to get the current up. So you see the current doesn't rise instantly. It rises slowly and, and it only chops a few times before it gets a, a, a signal to uh, commutate and turn the other phase on. So, so you see the average current is this value with going faster, the average current is much lower. And of course, uh, you, you wind up with a lot of torque ripple from that as well. Now, now I can fix that by advancing, phase advancing, what, which people call field weakening. And what I'm doing is I'm, 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 I'm starting this over here, where the back EMF is really negative. So that's the same polarity as the DC rail voltage, so so I've got, I'm using some of the back EMF voltage added to the rail voltage to force current in it to get it to come up almost square like it did before in PWM and chop. And I switch to phase AC, so so I my average current in there is about the same as it was here, twice the speed. So I and and people call this field weakening, but it's really phase advance now. Here's what I want to show you. The same eight pole motor with a sign drive at 1,000 RPM. And this is hysteresis control. You set a hysteresis band and, and that's a reference band. So you, you, so you have a current loop on there that's following the shape of this uh, sine wave hysteresis band. So at some chopping frequency, uh, so, so I, start, I start this not uh, 30 degrees late, but I start it at zero. When the back EMF is zero is when I start this. So, so I get a beautiful current wave shape there for each uh, line to line. This is A to B, uh, A to C, and B to A type thing. And then, okay. So, uh, so you see, you get a nice sinusoidal current. Uh, my average current or RMS is some value in here times the torque constant gives you the torque. Now. Now here's what I do, without any phase advance at all, I, I double the speed to 2,000 RPM. I don't have to phase advance at all, and, and, and I still get the same current in the machine, the same hysteresis band. Now one thing you notice is different though, you see the, the uh, chopping frequency in there was the same, but this is angle. 
So since I'm going twice as fast, it takes half the time to get through this uh, 180 electrical degree angle. So the chopping frequency looks much more coarse there. Now, if I keep going faster, it'll, it'll, it'll look even worse and it'll start to distort. And I'll show you a picture of that later. But uh, so that, that's the important, the important difference here is 120 degree commutation and commutating late after the vacuum F has already eaten up some of your DC rail voltage as compared to a sine drive where the, the process of commutating starts when the vacuum F is zero. So I can produce torque at a higher speed with no field weakening or phase advance with, an, with a sine drive on the exact same motor as a brush or as a uh, six step. That's the important news here. And uh, <clears throat> here's another picture of the same thing. It shows this shows you what the current, the torque looks like. See if if I if I've got a six step drive here and my current is square wave like that. That's what my torque looks like. If my back EMF is sinusoidal and my current is, is square, so this is what my uh, torque per phase looks like. After it's commutated, the torque looks like this. Whereas if I have a sinusoidal current and sinusoidal back EMF, this is what my torque looks like. And commutated, it's very low torque ripple. So that's, that shows you the, the reason why people like to have, with a sinusoidal drive, they want to have as close, they want to have a sinusoidal back EMF. I guess we're all aware of this, but it's worth noting just to remind us that this formula here that the frequency equals RPM times the number of poles divided by 120. If you use pole pairs instead of poles, then this is uh, divided by 60. It gives you the same thing. And, uh, and this is used to determine what the, the uh, uh, PWM frequency should be. So, and I've talked to a lot of drive guys, and to have a decent sinusoidal current, you need to have about 20 PWM chops per sine wave. That means... 5, uh, let's see, 5, 10, 15, 20. Yeah, you, you, you got, uh, let's see, 5, 10, 15, 20. So, you ha you, so, so if, you, if you find out what the commutation, fundamental commutation frequency is and divide it by 20, that's your PWM frequency. So, uh, if you, we're going to find that when, when we start a motor design, the very first thing I ask or want to find out and make sure that it's in the spec is uh, what's the maximum chopping frequency that the inverter designer can handle with losses? You know, what, what, what does his budget and his technology allow? You know, I talked to some guys and they have no problem with 40 kilohertz. Uh, uh, some I even know guys that say they have no problem with 100, but other people, uh, a lot of things you see out there are limited to 8, 9, 10 kilohertz uh, PWM frequency. That's all they want to uh, deal with the losses in the transistor spore. So, so that's very important uh, for, for the highest uh, torque density results from a high number of poles. That's just flat out true. High torque density means high number of poles, or, or a high number of poles gives you a high torque density. That's a better way of saying it. So, so uh, consequently then, I always want to know what's the maximum PWM frequency uh, we can live with on this project. And from that and this page right here, I determine what's the maximum number of poles I can use, and then I try to push for that number of poles in the design. Uh, this is this shows you another picture of what hysteresis control looks like. Uh, this is a, a slide that Tim Miller made that shows it nice and neatly. Uh, you notice that you do get overshoot and you get some leakage outside the hysteresis control band, but you you have a you have a set point current. You set a current and a hysteresis bandwidth, and and you PWM and you stay stay and try to stay inside of there.
and even a uh, even a, uh, uh, a Q and D axis control has to has to uh, stay in a hysteresis band as well. Uh, now, uh, field oriented control, flux vector control, all kinds of terms for the same thing here. Uh, and uh, it just seems like uh, the field oriented control has become so popular now that uh, that appears to be the best way to commission a, a drive to get a motor and a drive running. Everybody seems to love that. There's all kinds of, of mathematics available to do that with. Um, so that that's but but the uh, but the motor has three phases. But uh, you you can't so 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 what so. Uh, Clark and Park transformations are used to transform the uh, space vectors for all three of our type machines to to uh, to wind up with two control current control vectors the d axis current and q axis current. I'm not going to go. We're not going to go into that. You all are experts of that, but but uh, that that's what's used and and how to. But, but see, the motor designer, he doesn't really care about that. None of that information really helps him uh, design a motor. It's, it's really of not much use to him. It's, it's everything to the control designer and the inverter designer, but not to the motor designer. He doesn't really care about this. It's just interesting to think about and to talk about. But he's got to figure out how to uh, uh, minimize the current at low speed peak torques. And uh, and and uh, maximize the power that you can get out at high speeds at with a voltage some voltage limitation to try to do all that in the in the, in the same machine that requires a high constant power range over its torque speed range. That's what the motor engineer is concerned about. He's not concerned about how the inverter guy does that because if if, if if the if the motor engineer doesn't give the inverter guy the right machine characteristics, the inverter guy can't get the performance out of the machine either. So the field 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 oriented control started with induction machines, I believe it's safe to say. We've already seen where the history of brushless came from. So so this field oriented control came from uh, induction machines and. As we saw from a torque speed curve on the induction motor, if the induction motor is driven with uh, constant voltage and frequency, you you really have a limited operating range that you can control the motor over because you can't control the slip. But if you uh, if you uh, use field oriented control, then you keep the slip constant and you can control the magnetizing current. The, the current that produces the magnetic field. And so what we have here, we saw a vector diagram of it earlier, uh, but here you have the, the stator current. Here's our stator current. And that's divided up into two current vectors. The, the Q axis current produces the torque in the machine, but the D axis current magnetizes the circuit. It does what the magnets do. It provides the field that the magnets do. So uh, if with constant v, constant speed and frequency, this, is con this magnetizing current is controlled by the slip, and the slip is controlled by the load. So, so we have to, uh, to utilize that motor like a DC motor or to, to make the, you can't make the motor rotor think that, you, you, can't, you can't keep the poles from slipping, but you can keep the slip from changing. If you keep the slip constant on an induction rotor, in other words, the, the ratio of, the, uh, of uh, changing those rotor bar currents from plus to minus into the paper and out of the paper. If you could keep that rate constant, you could control the, uh, you, you can make the induction motor think it's a 
brushless motor. You can uh, morph it into a uh, brushless uh, uh, or, a, or a DC machine. And that's really what field-oriented control. So, uh, one, of, one of the techniques that's used today, and Yaskava has a wonderful product line to do this, is uh, I just mentioned in passing, is a multi-level inverter. Uh, for motor control, that uh, what that does is uh, it's got a lot of advantages here. But what this does is it uh, it allows essentially it reduces the losses in the inverter. That's its main feature. The motor sees a very nice sinusoidal current wave shape because it sees lots of chops in that hysteresis uh, bandwidth. Lots of chops. With not much excursion from Mac, you know, history is band pretty small, can be pretty small, and you see lots of chops, which normally would cause a lot of losses in the transistors, but those losses are mitigated by using uh, multiple bridges of uh, IGBT switches or FETs, and and uh, and so each bridge controls part of the sine wave. And then here's a, uh, a schematic showing a three-level inverter. I'm not going to describe how it works, but basically it uh, <coughs> the sine wave is divided up into three sections, and each bridge, each of the three bridges, uh, provides the chopping for only a third of the current wave shape. And so uh, you see... If you have 7 kilohertz uh, PWM frequency per bridge, the motor sees 21 kilohertz. Or if you use, uh, th that could even be doubled by using both sides of the triangular reference. So, so how is this useful to the me electric machine designer? What does he care about all these things? What he has to do is to come up with the right motor that uh, uh, some some inverter requirements want high inductance, some want low inductance. So the machine designer has to know how to do that. And uh, uh, then the other the other thing that the machine designer has to be concerned about is if you're going to use one of these machines as a generator. Now it gets really tricky to because when the inverter a designer models a generator, he models it as a black box in Simulink uh, under ideal conditions, but, but a lot of generators don't operate that way, particularly uh, ones that uh, uh, have, have poor linearity or uh, suffer from effects of saturation or armature reaction or things like that, because as you, any generator, as you load it down, as you apply loads to it and cause current to flow, that changes the flux linkage. Remember, all these machines do their thing due to the flux linkage between the rotor and the stator. So, so as, a current, as a current in a generator goes up, the flux from the rotor doesn't like seeing the, the magnetic field from the stator current, so, so it tries to find another path to get back to the uh, opposite pole, so you get flux linkage. It's called leakage reactants. So there's stator leakage reactants, rotor leakage reactants, and so these effects cause the voltage to go down. So, uh, so our machine is not linear because the uh, the flux linkage isn't linear. It varies with current. So, so uh, the machine designer has to predict what the output of the generator is going to be as the load goes up. Uh, here's a, a couple of very nice slides by uh, Tim Miller at the Speed Consortium that shows uh, the original brushless uh, system here. This is, uh, uh, this is a computer simulation of the same kind of plots I showed you from a scope on an earlier slide. The current's regulated to protect the transistors or to limit the torque of the machine by uh, PWM. You see that. You see that up here, of course, and of course, see the PWM is doing the chopping on the, in the hysteresis loop on the on the sine 
uh, wave is all. And you, you notice here, commutation starts at zero and uh, continues to 180 degrees, goes negative, and then to 360, whereas with the six-step or brushless system, commutation doesn't start till 30 degrees after zero. Let's see, so, so uh, you're going to use two-thirds of the copper two-thirds of the time here. Okay. Phase advance could be used, but at the expense of torque ripple and power factor. Uh, we haven't talked yet about this term here, fractional slot windings, but we will under, under section 15, where lecture 15 we'll be talking about uh, integral slot windings and fractional slot windings. Uh, if That's the slots per pole per phase. Uh, by the way, it doesn't matter uh, uh, between, that has nothing to do with how it's driven. You can use, uh, well, I won't say it has nothing to do with it, but uh, you don't pick a number of slots per pole per phase based on how it's going to be driven. You don't do it that way because uh, these back EMFs are independent of the number of slots per pole per phase, usually. Um, some of these things, haulback and ring magnets, those are, uh, we'll, we'll show pictures of haulback magnets later. Um, here's, uh, here's another example of, uh, that came from the speed lab, uh, that there's another example of a sign, a sign machine even that, that, uh, you had to phase advance, like the brushless. This is a 1,000 RPM, very low voltage, 24 volt DC rail going to the motor. And uh, and what happened here is that 1,000 RPM, it's no, there's plenty of voltage to generate our our uh, sinusoidal current. And, but, but just going from 1,000 RPM to 1,300 RPM, and now we're saturating and and we cannot get nice sinusoidal currents in the machine. But if we, if we phase advance or field weaken 60 degrees, why uh, that, that uh, cleans this right up and we're getting uh, the same torque out at, at the same 1,300 feet. See the, uh, this is not a plot of torque, this is a plot of current, but remember it's a PM machine. So when you look at current, you're looking at torque. So uh, at 1300 RPM with the same, uh, with no advance or no field weakening, your, since your average current went down, that means your average torque went down, okay? And in the, so, so we've a phase advance or field weakened, and so we're back up to the same current that we were here, so that means we're back up to the same torque. Now this is the final slide here. A lot of uh, inverter guys will uh, will uh, analyze their uh, sign drive and motor capabilities by using these circle diagrams. There's all different variations of these circle diagrams that where you plot a uh, voltage limit circle and a current limit circle, and and uh, this is gamma here, and and so from this you you can uh, plot a trajectory of uh, what the maximum power you can get out of this machine and inverter combination here. Uh, salient pole machines, these shapes become elliptical, they're not round anymore. But uh, motor guys don't, this isn't relevant to design a machine, this is important for the controller inverter guys. So that concludes this uh, lecture. Thank you very much.